Are you ready for Christmas? If you haven't finished your shopping, you may be in for some long lines. Christmas is always one of those times when we expect things to be nice, peaceful, tranquil. When we take some time off from the way we normally do life and things should slow down a little bit. But if we're really honest with ourselves, oftentimes we find Christmas to be a time of stress. We have to go shopping and get all the stuff and make sure we've bought presents for every person and maybe have to clean up the house because we're having people over. Not this year, I hope. And we have to cook that perfect dinner and we have to pay for all the presents that we got. And then we're going to have to catch up on work maybe when we get back after the holidays. And so despite the fact that we have these grand expectations for Christmas, oftentimes our experience falls short. But if we look at the Christmas story in the Bible, we understand that even the first Christmas was not this beautiful moment of peace and tranquility that we often imagine it. It is a time of great disruption for the people involved. It starts with the visit of an angel to Mary to tell her that she is going to be the mother of the promised king, the Messiah who is going to deliver Israel from its sins. And this, of course, is great news, but there's a dark side to it. You see, people can count to nine months, and they're going to know that Mary and Joseph, well, that doesn't really add up. They're going to, con- they're going to believe that Mary is morally suspect for the rest of her days. And of course, Mary has to be apprehensive about how Joseph is going to handle this. And sometime later, it appears Joseph comes to realize that Mary is pregnant. And we might understand that he's deeply hurt by this. They're an engaged couple, and it seems that she's been unfaithful to him. As he contemplates breaking off the engagement, an angel appears to him and says, no, this is actually God's work. He's the father. So don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And of course, this is good news, but at the same time, there's also maybe a little bit of bad news for Joseph mixed in with all of this. After all, people are going to look at him for the rest of his life and either assume that he and Mary couldn't wait for the wedding night, or they're going to assume that she was unfaithful and he's fathering somebody else's child. And so he is going to be an object of derision for the rest of his days. And of course, all of this is bad enough, but then comes taxes. Yes, they're, <laughs> they're called to go and register in Bethlehem so that Caesar can squeeze every little bit of tax out of them. And so Joseph has to take Mary along with him because she's going to give birth while they're there. And so they have to undertake a long journey, 150 kilometers, through open country that's hot in the daytime and cold at night. There's danger from wild animals and danger from bandits, and it's not nice even flat land. It's all up and down and up and down and up and down. Oh, when they finally get there, there's no room for them. And so baby Jesus is born with the animals. And then they finally seem to catch a break. Along come magi from the east, and they give presents of gold and incense and myrrh. But of course, they had to stop along the way and tell King Herod, the psychopathic, super paranoid king who killed his own sons to ward off a threat to the throne and who has absolutely no compunction about killing babies to do the same. And so they have to flee for their lives. And they go, and a lot of scholars believe they might have gone to Alexandria, where a major portion of the city was Jewish. Well, if so, the 150-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem pales in comparison. Over the most direct possible way, it's about 500 kilometers to get to Alexandria. And when they finally get there, after a while, they're told that Herod has died. And they come back. Now they seem to be intent on settling in Judea, the southern part of the country where Bethlehem is. But when they get there, they realize that there was a change of plans. Herod had originally been intending to have one of his sons, who was an able administrator, take over the entire country. But at the last minute, he broke the country up into three pieces. And Judea is now under the rule of his cruel and incompetent son, Archelaus. 
Joseph is afraid that if he goes back to Judea, Archelaus might pick up where Herod had left off and might try and kill them, and so he has to go into hiding. An angel tells him that's the proper course, and so they head north again and settle in Nazareth in Galilee. So through all of these experiences, the early Christmas story is one of upheaval and uncertainty. We're used to seeing it as a pageant of children doing cute things. But in the end, it's really more like an action-adventure movie. And if you've watched many action-adventure movies, you probably have a good sense of how it's going to end, but you know that along the way it always looks bleak for the protagonist. It always looks like if they set one foot wrong, they are going to spiral into disaster. But you can trust that the screenwriter has everything under control and will get it to its ultimate and proper conclusion. And in that same way, Mary and Joseph have learned that God is in control of circumstances, that he will lead it to its proper conclusion, and so they can find peace amidst all of the difficulties that they encounter along the way. They follow the example of what Paul later tells the Philippian church to do. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Mary and Joseph don't trust God because it's easy. They trust him because they've seen him at work, doing miraculous things, and so they have learned to trust him. And in that place of trust, they find peace. Now, you and I can have this same peace if we also learn to trust in God's goodness and his purposes. God wants you to know that he is not surprised by the situations in which you find yourself. He's not out of his depth trying to deal with your struggles. He's not flummoxed by unforeseen consequences of things that he's done. God is faithful, and he will get you to the end of where you're going. But you have to learn to trust him. We must discipline ourselves. We must say no when we want to fear or be afraid. Instead, trust in God's goodness. And when we learn to instinctively trust him, to know he is good and he is able to take us where he wants us to go, that we can find peace. Now, what I'm not saying is that life will always be easy. That somehow having faith in God's ability and his goodness will insulate us from tragedy, from difficulty, from hardship, from disruption. We can see in the life of Mary and Joseph that it certainly does not. God does not promise to make our lives easy. Instead, he promises us that nothing will separate us from his love. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, talks about how even when Christians are suffering difficult things, even when things look bleak, that we can have confidence in God's love and in his ability to bring us to its right conclusion. In Romans 8, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any power, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our lives aren't about avoiding hardship. They're about finding God's victory in the midst of that hardship. God's love holds us firmly, if rarely comfortably. If we expect a smooth ride, we're going to be disappointed. We are going to feel like God has let us down or abandoned us. But if we understand that God's goal is the coming of his kingdom on earth and his glory, and we take that goal as our own, 
then we know that nothing will stop him from achieving his goal. And if we cooperate with him, then we will be instrumental in meeting that goal. Difficulty can lead us to despair, but only if we can't see past the suffering and the difficulty that we encounter. If we know that in the end it will all be okay, we can endure so much more. So how do we find peace in the midst of our difficult circumstances? We surrender to God, following Mary's example. When the angel comes and tells her about this plan that's about to happen, she doesn't protest. She misunderstands and asks some questions for clarification. But in the end, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. We see this same pattern in the life of Jesus. On the night Jesus is betrayed, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he pours his heart out before God. He's stressed because he knows that he's going to go through something that is awful. In the end, he prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus is honest about his apprehensions, but he is committed to being faithful to the mission that God has given to him. And in his commitment to his faithfulness, he is strengthened. And in that strength, he finds peace. I had a similar, although much less, (laughs) experience. I had a job quite a number of years ago that I really, really hated. Part of that was just my bad attitude at the time and my immaturity. But I was tired all the time because it was a three-shift rotation. I was isolated from my friends and was lonely, and uh, I just found the work unrelentingly boring. And I remember protesting over and over, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? I don't enjoy this. Can't it stop? Make it stop but it didn't. And so I just kept right on going, God, this is terrible. Why have you abandoned me in this situation? Why are you asking me to go through this? What possible purpose is there in this? And eventually, I came to the end of myself. One day I remember praying, and not just saying this to sound pious to myself, but really meaning it and saying, God, look, if there's any way that I don't have to be here, then I pray that you would take me out of that but it's your right to keep me here. And if it's your will for me to be here for the foreseeable future, then I just ask that you give me the strength and the grace to endure this season of my life. And at that moment, I finally felt peace. I felt like no matter what happens, I'm in God's hands and I can trust him. Now, as it happened, just a couple of weeks later, I was given a job offer for a job that was a much better fit for me in terms of my interests and my skill set. And so I was able to leave that job. That's not to say that if we simply submit to God in the midst of our trials, that God will take those trials away. As someone far more poetic than me has said before, sometimes God calms the storm, and sometimes God calms us in the midst of the storm. There's no guarantee that God takes away our struggles when we submit to his will, but if we submit to his will, then if we are delivered or if we are taken through, we know that we can find peace in whatever circumstances we face. So, this Christmas season, maybe you are having a peaceful time, and if so, praise God. He brings us good gifts. But if you are going through a challenging time, a difficult time, a disruptive time, something that has completely upset all of your plans, know that God is faithful even in the midst of this and that you can surrender to him. And he will bring you through to the other side. He is faithful and he can give us peace even in the midst of the most trying circumstances.